enough. We've done enough achievements. And, and what happens is when we're in that vein sometimes, that all, that stuff we've done, the stuff we've accomplished, the stuff we have, like a nice car and a nice home and a nice you know, husband or wife or five kids or three kids or whatever the automatic fantastic number is for you, whatever that is, those achievements and those things that we have can get tangled up with our identity, with our worth as a human being. Uh, do you remember uh, the movie Chariots of Fire? Raise your hand if you remember the movie Chariots of Fire. It was a long time ago. It's a great one to watch, but uh, from the 1980s. Chariots of Fire, it's a fact-based story about two British runners who are uh, competitors uh, in the 1924 Olympics. And they have uh, kind of, they have two different views on life. There's this one dude, his name is uh, Eric Liddell, and, and he runs, he runs to glorify God. He runs for God. And then there's this other uh, guy, and his name is Harold Abrahams, and, and he runs basically to glorify himself. And so Abrahams, in, in one part of the movie, when he's um, reflecting on his upcoming race, this is what he says. He says, and now in one hour's time, I will be out there again. I will raise my eyes and look down that corridor. I'll be out there again. That four foot wide corridor, and he says this, with ten lonely seconds to justify my existence. But will I? You see? You see what he's saying? You see what he's saying that, that we could very easily fall into? His performance is what justifies his existence. And, and will he do enough? Will he be fast enough to qualify, to validate himself? So that doors of opportunity are open in his life. And this is how we can think of that it works with God. We can think that it works this way with God. That we have to justify our existence. That we have to do things, uh, you know, to build our record with God. You know, you know, we may go through kind of the, we might not write this out, but mentally we think through this. You know, well, I helped somebody this week. I gave somebody a few bucks at work that needed you know, needed some help, and hey, I, I went to church. I actually went to church three times this month. That is way ahead of the average American going to church. Uh, we, we may think about, um, you know, I'm pretty nice to people that drive me bananas. I'm very patient. I'm very kind, and, and all along the way, we're hoping that the record that we present to God is good enough. That he will accept us. That we will, you know, justify our existence. That um, it will open up doors or pearly gates. <laughs> pearly gates of opportunity to us. So in this passage, two ways are presented on how we have an acceptable record with God. Two ways are, are laid out here and in the whole Bible, but particularly in this passage. Two ways are, are laid out. There's, uh, let me give them to you. There's righteousness by behaving, and there's righteousness by believing. So there's, uh, I'll, I'll say it this way, a valid performance by behaving, and then a validating performance by believing. So let's look at the first one. Righteousness by behaving. And uh, following, uh, what, what that means is behaving, you know, the right conduct, the right practices, and, and how is this? This is uh, following the law of God without flaw. That's what we're going to find here, is that to be valid with God, you, um, you keep God's law without flaw, and then you are righteous. You've done right behavior. You've kept it all right. But the Bible reveals that this is a very difficult standard. It's a very high standard. Uh, there's a passage over in the book of James. Um, it's a later book in the New Testament. James chapter 2. And uh, James chapter 2, in this part of the Bible, he's, he's kind of talking to people who are discriminating and um, who are showing favoritism to other people and so on and so forth. And so this is what James chapter 2, it'll be up on the screen, says here. James chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. If you really keep the royal law found in the scripture, scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. 
But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. And then in verse 10, for whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Do you see the standard here? Do you see God's standard here? If you're going to present an acceptable record to God, if you're going to put together your resume for God and lay it down to God, it, based on your conduct, it has to be perfect. There, there can't be any, oh, I was sleeping on that one. Oh, whoops, I missed that one. You can't stumble at any point. You have to perform perfectly. For most of us, Here, I think most of us would admit here, that is a burden too heavy to bear, isn't it? Um, For for most of us, we have a pretty uh, fine understanding of our sinfulness, of our wrongdoing, of the things that we struggle with. Now, they may be different than the other person, but you may be well aware of the areas that you really wrestle with. At the first uh, Easter gathering that Genesis Church had uh, several years ago now, we had a very small crowd at that first one. And one of the things that we did was I had everybody, uh, there was a piece of paper for them to write a sin on that they either believed God had forgiven them from or one, they were seeking forgiveness. And then at one point in the uh, gathering, everybody was able to come up and kind of pin it to the cross, you know, as a, as a way of, celebrating their forgiveness or actually asking forgiveness and so at the end of the service i went and got that stack there was like 30 of them and i just i remember rifling through that and i just cried i mean because these were people in they're my church you know and they've been going you know the things that they shared that they had gone through it really it struck a chord with my heart It, it was things like adultery and abortion and pornography addiction Gambling that destroyed a family's finances. Uh, uncontrollable anger. Those are just a few that I remembered from that experience. And, uh, you know, that may weigh, there may be something like that in your life that weighs on your heart. And when I tell you that in order to be righteous, in order to be justified, in order to have a record with God that's acceptable, you have to be perfect. And you know right away that takes me out. What I did 10 years ago, what I did yesterday, what I thought this morning takes me out. The reality is there was only one man who ever lived who was righteous by those standards, who was, who was righteous by his behavior. Um, over in uh, the Gospel of John, uh, let me read just one verse. John 19, 4 says this. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. This is Jesus. There was no, there was no uh, valid reason why Jesus should be crucified. Then I'm going to move to um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Here's another verse. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. It's Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life. And he was tempted. And he can empathize with us as we live lives of temptation. And then over in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So see, um, righteousness by behaving, it's off the table for us. But let's move on to the second one. It's righteousness by believing. Righteousness I believe, and we want to look at this and talk about how this works. Uh, verse, uh, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 22, the passage we read a little earlier. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ 
to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile. You see, the validating performance that opens doors is through faith in Christ. That's what this passage is teaching us. And that's why we're gathered here this morning, because this is great news. This is like, we can't do this on our own, and yet there's a way. And it's through personal, ongoing, individual faith in Christ. Individual faith in Christ that it is He who saves. He saves us from our sins. He saves us for eternity. And He saves us every day of our lives. He justifies us. And the key word is faith. Faith, which can be also translated believe in, to believe in something. And, and my favorite way to translate this is trust. It, it's really about faith in Christianity is really about trust in a person. It's about trust in a person. Will you trust somebody? Will you really trust someone with your life? I'm grateful for Sydney and Dane sharing a little bit of their testimonies on the video just earlier, why they trust Christ. And and the question is, will you? Will you trust him with your life? Will will you trust him with the the most important thing in your life? And and, in this passage, it, it shares here that this is all a gift. It's all a gift by grace. It's all a gift by grace that came through the redemption of Christ. A gift. A gift is something you've got to receive. You've got to accept it. I was kind of thinking of this analogy earlier. I wasn't going to use it, but it's here again in my brain. It's not a perfect analogy. So let's say you're at a football game. Anybody ever go to a football game? Raise your hand. You're at a football game, and you decide to buy a raffle ticket. Okay, so that's where the the analogy breaks down a little bit, because you bought a raffle ticket. But here's where it doesn't break down is they call your number. And is that a happy thing? When you win 50 bucks, what do you do? Somebody show me right now. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, all right. So you won 100 bucks, 50 bucks. If it's a Friday night, it might be a lot more. Who knows? So you, but what do you got to do to get the money? You got to go, you got to go up to the booth. I've never won. <laughs> How do you get it? You got to go to receive it, don't you? They call your number, boom, you take your number to show, and then they give you the money. You want it. And this is the same way. you got to go receive it. It's a gift. You don't buy a raffle ticket for it. Okay, so please forget that part of my analogy. But remember the part where you've got to go and receive it. You've got to accept it into your life. You've got to bring it into your life. And it's based on the redemption of Christ. That's what validates it. And, and, that's, and this is what it says here. It says uh, in verse, in those verses we read, uh, let me read, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his patience, his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ. You see how this, uh, the righteousness by belief, how it works? It works through the redemption of Christ. It works through what he has done. God demonstrated a perfect record through Christ. He didn't do it by sweeping sins under the rug and just, okay, I'm just going to forgive that. No, he dealt with it. And that's why, that's why the verse says that God is just. It's actually the same word for righteousness, but in the English we translate it differently. But he is just. He does what is right. He follows his own rules. And then the best part of that is he's just, God is just, and the one who justifies. He's the one that makes righteous. Same word. So based on what Christ did, his atoning sacrifice, his, he paid for it, We can be justified because of that, by faith, by faith. So here's the conclusion for today. 
You are not valid on your own record. You will never be valid on your own record. You can't do it. You will not have enough stuff. (laughs) You will not get enough achievements. Or you will not help enough old ladies cross the street or give enough money to the church, even Genesis Church. You will not, you will never validate on your own. You are not valid on your own, but with Christ, you are valid. Is that fun? Is that good? I mean, I think that is good. It's counterintuitive, though, isn't it? We think we have to do something to earn uh, validity. We have to do something to be accepted. But this is where the gospel redefines everything. I I got a definition of the gospel I want to put up on the screen by Tim Keller. It says this, the gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hoped for. It it takes two beliefs to become a Christian. Two beliefs, two basic beliefs, and they're represented by the two lines on the cross up there. The one belief is a belief in yourself. Who, Who are you and what are you able to do? And the right belief to become a Christian is, I am unable to do anything. I am broken. And then the other line that corresponds with the top part of the cross is your belief in God, a growing belief in God that he is my answer. And he is the one that provide, has provided for me everything that I've needed. And now, with gratitude, I live my life for him. He's done everything for me. I did nothing for myself. Everything I have is because of his grace and because of his mercy. That, my friends, is the gospel. And that's what we teach as a church here. That's what we believe. So what does it mean? It, it means that if you're here today and you're living on your own merits... And now you see the futility of that, you can trust in Christ. You can do it today. As Brenda prayed earlier, you can surrender. You can give up the fight. You can open your hands and say, Christ, come into my life. I'm broken. I can't do this. I've been trying to do this for years. I've been trying to do this on my own. I can't do it. Come into my life. I surrender to you. I surrender my sinfulness, and I trust in Christ's redemption. What does it mean to you if you believe? You already believe, and you're here, and you're like, okay, Norm, I know all this information. Thank you very much. And what it means is you still do not need to validate yourself. We go through life building our self-esteem and our self-worth based on what we do. And as followers of Jesus We need to stop that. I want to tell you, if you follow Jesus, you are a child of the Most High King. The God who reigns. The creator. The designer. The one who loves you beyond what you could ever imagine. And those are pretty good things, by the way. He loved you when you were unlovable. And you know what you need to do? You need to preach that to yourself every day. You need to preach that to yourself, that my accomplishments at work are not my self-worth. What I drive down the road is not my self-worth. What my kids are doing today is not my self-worth. All those things, I open my hand to you, Lord, and I I hold them up to you. We need to preach that to ourselves. And what happens when you begin to preach that to yourself as a follower of Christ? It begins to grow gratitude in your life. Instead of expecting God to do things for you and like, you're not doing this for me, God, when I want, you're like, you're grateful. You're you're filled with gratitude. I'm going to have the band come up right now. I want to end just with this uh, little uh, quote from a song from Petra. Anybody remember Petra? That was a long time ago. Petra. I love this song. And uh, let me just, I won't sing it, I promise, but I am going to read it. It says this, he's talking to Jesus. He came, he saw, he conquered death and hell. He came, he saw, he is alive and well. He was, he is, and only he forgives. He came, he saw, 
he conquered. And that's why we can trust him. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I I sense that there may be people here today just really wrestling with their self-worth that follow you, Lord. And I pray today that they'll come up forward and seek prayer at the end by one of our prayer teams. They'll, They'll share that on their connection card that they can dump off as they leave. And we'll pray for them, Lord. I just, I beg you, God, to begin to work in all of our lives. And, and for those that are, that are here that, that have not trusted you, that today they would turn to you and they would trust in you for their validation. Lord, may that happen. And I praise you that you live so that we can face tomorrow. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. sing a song of reflection today and just pray that you be encouraged by the lyrics and then you're welcome to join in singing and worship
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you so much for this great day. Thank you for saving our lives, for saving our souls, and bringing us into your kingdom. I pray, Lord, that we would reflect on that for the rest of the day and then go out and live uh, for the gospel, Lord. Help us to share this with other people. We do give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.